Hi, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us for this special webinar. I'm Kevin Keller, CEO of CFP Board. Joining me today from Fort Lauderdale, where we're attending NAPFA's large firm conference, is Dan Moisand, CFP, uh, a distinguished CFP professional and chair of our board of directors. Just about two weeks ago, CFP board announced an important new step in our evolution to advance the profession for the benefit of the public. We wanted to hold a webinar to provide an opportunity for our CFP professionals and other stakeholders to hear directly from us about why CFP board is changing and provide an opportunity to address any questions you may have about the change. CFP board largely relies on our CFP professionals and other stakeholders to achieve our mission to benefit the public, as it is our CFP professionals who provide the public with the access to competent and ethical financial planning. We would not be able to achieve our work without you, and so it is important that you understand the rationale behind the recent change to CFP Board's corporate structure so that we can continue to work together to advance the financial planning profession for the benefit of the public. We are grateful to each of you for your support of CFP Board and the support of CFP certification. We have a presentation to share with you today, and most importantly, we'll make sure that we leave plenty of time to address any questions you may have. But before we start, here are a couple quick housekeeping notes. If you run into issues with the audio, or if it seems like the slides are out of sync, you should refresh your webinar console. Press F5 or Control-R for Windows systems and Command-R for the Mac. There is a Q&A function on your screen that you can use to submit questions. We'll address as many questions as possible during the Q&A portion after the prepared program, and if we don't get to your question today, CFP Board will follow up to provide an answer. So, Dan, why don't you get us started? Thank you, Kevin, and thank you all for making the time to join us today. Uh, late January, CFP Board announced an important development in our organizational evolution. It will advance the financial planning profession for the benefit of the public. Demand for financial planning has never been stronger. As more Americans seek financial advice, large firms and small are embracing financial planning as a core service. But with tens of thousands of financial advisors expected to retire in the coming decade, our country faces a dearth of competent and ethical financial planners. And that's why the board identified workforce as one of our strategic priorities for the 2022 through 2026 period. Our goal is to have a significant impact on the future of the profession and to meet the growing public demand for competent and ethical financial planners. Yet, as we set out to strengthen the financial planner workforce, we recognize that CFP Board's 501c3 tax status limited the activities that we can pursue on behalf of the profession and our CFP professionals. We need to build a diverse and sustainable financial planning workforce, yet our tax status limits how we promote financial planning careers. So to help achieve our strategic priorities, the Board of Directors directed CFP Board to establish a new 501c6 nonprofit professional organization. This change positions CFP Board to promote the benefits of a financial planning career and advance the financial planning profession to benefit the public. CFP Board is going to operate two affiliated organizations, both focused on achieving CFP Board's strategic priorities. To ensure the ongoing strategic alignment of the two organizations, the Board of Directors for the 501c3 will also be the Board of Directors and the sole voting members of the 501c6. That means the c3 literally controls the c6. The 501c6 organization will be called CFP Board of Standards. The 501c3 organization will be called CFP Board Center for Financial Planning. The new missions of the two entities are as follows. 
for the 501c3 CFP Board Center for Financial Planning. The mission is to advance competent and ethical financial planning and expand CFP professional diversity for the benefit of the public. For the 501c6 called CFP Board of Standards, the mission is to credential competent and ethical financial planners to uphold CFP certification as the recognized standard and to advance the financial planning profession. There are some key governance components of this organizational structure. It was very important to the board that the organization remain closely tied to its C3 roots. The board of directors has been clear that the public benefit of CFP board's work remains paramount. The public interest that has been the heart of CFP board as a 501c3 will continue to be a core element of our work to advance the profession under our new structure. So as I mentioned earlier, the C3 literally controls the C6. The sole members of the C6 will be the board of directors of the existing 501c3 organization. CFP board is not establishing a traditional membership organization for financial planners. We're forming a 501c6 to focus on the organization's strategic priorities. We are not establishing local chapters, publishing a member magazine, providing affinity marketing, or practice support services. All of those things are the types of services you get from a traditional membership association, such as the FPA or NAPA. CFP, is not, CFP board is not forming a PAC. These traditional membership association services will continue to be handled by NAPA and FPA. We will continue working collaboratively with those organizations and others in the financial advice ecosystem uh, to advance the profession for the public's benefit. We expect there will be minimal impact on the way CFP professional community interacts with CFP board. There will be some internal changes, including a realignment of programs and functions under the two organizations. This does not, however, change the CFP certification requirements uh, or our work to set and enforce the CFP certification standards. Additionally, the board has been clear that the public benefit of CFP board's work remains paramount, and even as we undertake programs focused on advancing the profession. With this change, we can communicate more directly about the value that the public receives from hiring a CFP professional. And a stronger financial planning workforce will benefit everyone in the profession. Greater awareness of financial planning careers will help establish financial planning as a recognized and respected profession. And the last thing that's not going to change are the fees. Thanks. No increase Jim. there at all. Appreciate it. You know, this change is uh, so important for everyone in the profession. The most talented college-bound students don't even know that financial planning is a great career choice. We've been losing young talent to other established professions because we haven't been able to share the full value proposition of financial planning careers. So this change will contribute greatly to ending the talent shortage we've been experiencing today. This is also uh, will have an impact on how we communicate to the public through our public awareness campaign and other consumer advertising. We've made great strides in growing awareness of CFP certification, and with the new structure, we'll be able to state more directly that people need to hire a CFP professional. If you look at our strategic priorities, those things we are now able to do with a C6 will impact most of them. The changes will be key to our achieving our workforce priority and to achieving our goals under the access priority. The changes will also enhance our ability to achieve our awareness priority. And together, they will not only propel CFP board forward, but advance the profession of financial planning. Our vision for the profession's future can only become a reality with a more diverse and more sustainable workforce. The workforce priority is one that is especially important for the profession's future. Demand for financial planning has never been stronger than it is today. More and more Americans are seeking the peace of mind and confidence that comes from working with a competent and ethical financial planner 
who takes a holistic view of their clients' finances and goals. Financial services firms are responding to that demand by embracing financial planning as a core service and expanding their financial advisor workforce. <clears throat> financial planners are enjoying, enjoying rewarding careers, helping people manage their finances and achieve their goals, and they're reporting extremely high satisfaction with their career choice. And yet many firms are struggling to fill financial planning positions. Substantial work will be required to establish a sustainable pipeline of future financial planning talent. CFP Board is in a unique position to bring together the leaders from across the financial advice ecosystem to launch a national movement to address this critical workforce shortage issue. And one way we're looking to do that is through a new initiative at CFP Board that will raise awareness of financial planning careers among college-bound students. Young people today don't know what a CFP professional is or what CFP professionals do. In fact, young people today have little awareness that financial planning is even a career option. We need to change that and generate awareness among younger demographics about the rewarding and in-demand careers that CFP professionals enjoy. During 2022, the CFP Board conducted market research for this initiative. This included college-bound high school students, college freshmen and sophomores, as well as their parents. While awareness of financial planning careers is low, we are finding messages that make these groups want to learn more. When we provided brief information about the financial planning professions, parents understood it, and they quickly recognized financial planning's value as a potential career option for their college-bound kids. Through our research, we are identifying and validating key messages that generate positive perceptions of financial planning careers and lead students to pursue financial planning degrees. We're very excited about this initiative, which has great potential to strengthen the financial planning workforce. This will advance CFP Board's workforce priority. It will also provide great value for financial planning educators as well as new talent for your practice. These new programs will supplement our existing programs that have already begun to make an impact on workforce development. For example, our mentorship program connects individuals preparing to take the CFP exam with volunteer CFP professionals who can help them prepare for that experience. And our Career Center provides job listings for CFP professionals as well as individuals pursuing CFP certification. The Career Center also includes listings for internships. If your firm has internship opportunities, you can post them on CFP Board's Career Center free of charge. Now we had one guy, Dan, who had a three-year internship. That's not an internship. These are, you know, for the free listings apply for people who have a traditional internship. Yeah. We have also published two career guides. The first is focused on current financial planners and firms with guidance to help firms recruit, onboard, train, develop, and retain the next generation of financial planning talent. The second is focused on helping students and career changers get an understanding of what financial planning careers are about and how to get started. You can find these guides and other career development resources on our website at cfp.net slash career hyphen center. So we have a number of programs advancing our workforce priority. Before we get to your questions, I want to touch briefly on two other important initiatives. The first is related to our certification and standards priority under the topic of competency standards. 
Dan, when we talk about our standards, I think most people naturally think of our ethical standards, and that's an important part of CFP certification. But just important are the competency standards. CFP board sets and administers these standards for CFP certification. A few years ago, CFP re reviewed our ethical standards, and as we celebrate the 50th year, that first class earned their CFP certification in 1973. As we celebrate this 50th year of CFP certification, it's time to review our competency standards of education, experience, <clears throat> and examination. The Board of Directors has directed us to establish a competency standards commission, much like we had an ethical standards commission that will validate the current requirements and or recommend changes for improvement that address the competency of candidates for CFP certification and also the continued competency of existing CFP professionals. Uh, the second initiative that I want to just mention is the main program within our awareness priority or the public awareness campaign. Last year's advertising was uh, on the air from mid-March through the end of May with digital advertising and electronic uh, support throughout the year. As we do each year, we measure the campaign's progress and we conducted a brand tracking study conducted by an independent research firm. This year, the study found that total awareness of CFP certification among the target audience is at 87 percent. That's a four percentage point increase over the last year's total awareness measure and also the highest that we've seen since we launched the campaign way back in 2011. Awareness is the primary goal of the campaign, but this year we also focused on making progress with the next step of the marketing funnel, and that would be coming farther down that marketing funnel to increasing preference for CFP certification. Our study found that preference for CFP certification among the target audience reached 79%, again, another 4% increase. I'm pleased to share that this year's campaign will feature all new advertising. Dan, we looked at some of the rough cuts a couple of weeks ago. I'm excited about the new approach. It is a little more directive, consistent with the corporate change that we're making about why the public needs a CFP professional. The campaign will launch uh, March 20th, and we'll be holding a webinar on March 15th to give the CFP community an advanced look at the new ad. So save the date and keep your eyes out for that change. So Dan, we got a number of questions. We had some that came in ahead of time. Uh, and the um, we've had some that have just come in from people who are watching. Why don't we dive Right in, are you ready? Yeah, let's do it, it's my favorite part. Great, so Dan, I'll give you the first question. Um, Keith writes, why is it better to pursue the goals with a new organization instead of under the existing one? Yeah, so imagine trying to acquire clients when you can't tell them about all the benefits that they would get by becoming a client. That's kind of the situation that that we were in as a 501c3. We had to focus the majority of our message uh, strongly on benefits to the public. And when you're talking about enticing somebody uh, to check out a career in financial planning, uh, they're interested in what's in it for them, quite frankly. I mean, they want to help people and all that, and they're attracted to that part of the, of the work, but uh, we need to be able to communicate more directly. So with the 501c6 organization, we're in a better position to promote the benefits of the financial planning career and take other actions that will benefit the profession. 
So we're developing programs supporting our workforce priority, including a groundbreaking new program to increase awareness of financial planning careers among college-bound students. Uh, we'll be able to communicate much more directly about the benefits of uh, the career. You know, Dan, uh, when we did, when we did, when we tested and we did market research and we asked people, uh, college-bound students, their parents, undergrads, uh, we tested various messages like you can make a good living, uh, you get to help people, uh, you have flexibility, career flexibility. The highest, the most compelling was the opportunity to earn a good living. And, you know, that's been something we haven't been able to talk about for not much anyway. Right. <laughs> yep. um, I think this next question from Dallas. Dallas asks, why did the C6 take the Certified Financial Planner Board of Standards name? And at the same time, Neil, our friend Neil, asked, Please address, well, where did where'd the question go? I had a question here from Neil. I'm not sure where it went. We're scrolling. Neil asked, please confirm that the newly formed center will continue to be fully subsidiary to the standard setting body. So we need to, I think we should clarify, but let's talk first of all, Dan, and I'll jump in on the C6, and then we'll go to Neil's. They're somewhat related. So certification bodies, uh, the current guidance from the IRS is that certification bodies are C6, 501 C6. So CFP board uh, was a bit of an outlier. Our work to set and enforce certification standards is one of the main functions that are part of the C6, the new C6 organization. So it made sense to call the C6 the Certified Financial Plan and CFP Board of Standards. The work of our Center for Financial Planning has been largely squarely right in the wheelhouse of our C3 organization and its mission and the center work has generated some strong brand recognition. We looked at, I don't know, 30 or 40 different possible names as we were looking at this, and we just kept coming back to this. So C6, CFP Board of Standards, that's where the certification, the standard setting, the enforcement is. C3, the traditional, more charitable kinds of functions, scholarships, fundraising, pro bono, and the other particular areas there. Now we should address, let's go back to Neil's question, if you can pull that one up, Jim. Neil asks, please confirm the newly formed center will continue to be fully subsidiary to the standard setting body. And that's not right. I think if we've conveyed that, do you want to take that? The board of directors of the C6 is the same as the board of the directors of the C3. The only voting members of the C6 are the board members of the C3. So the three controls the six, not the other way around. Great. Thanks, Dan. Hope that helps, Neil. Give me a call if you still have questions. Um, another question, Dan, for you. <clears throat> Angela asks, uh, how do we ensure the board is focused on the priorities of the membership and not the priorities of a few vocal individuals. Um, not that there are, are, not that we have any vocal individuals yeah, in the financial know. planning profession. Yeah, so the work of CFP board, as it's constituted um, last year and this year, even after this change, uh, goes through a process to develop the strategic priorities for the organization. Uh, the five blocks you saw cover the period from 2022 to 2026 are areas of focus for those, those years. But we started the process of, of determining what those were gonna be back at the end of 2019 uh, and through a variety of different uh, focus groups and talking to many different types of stakeholders and looking at what needs to happen to advance the profession and where is CFP board best positioned to make a difference we drew the blocks out of that. So um, the, the way you keep a, a few vocal people from overtaking an organization is you get more input from more voices and you have a, a process of 
getting through that information to, to come to a final conclusion. Great. Thanks, Dan. Um, Evelyn asks, uh, she says this is an exciting uh, development. Uh, how do you anticipate this new structure will allow the board of the C6 to collaborate more closely with the, quote, traditional membership? And since Evelyn was closely involved in FPA, uh, FPA and NAPFA, we use that. How, how will this allow that to happen? Yeah, it, it's, uh, it opens up a lot more possibilities. Um, I am the past president of the National FPA. That's his president. Yes, yeah, thank you for your service, man. Um, hope to see you next week out, out when we're out in California. Um, so we will very often wanted to collaborate with CFP board on, on things. With FPA. With, yes, FPA yeah. uh, wanted to collaborate with CFP board on things, and very often we were told that couldn't happen because of the 501c3 tax status. So that's no longer a barrier uh, to collaboration. Um, so we have, uh, from time to time, uh, through the Financial Planning Coalition, put out joint things in the advocacy area. We've declined to do things because we are solely a C3. We now have the ability to do more stuff. Um, so that's pretty exciting. On the other hand, it means we don't have the, uh, the easily identified excuse of being able to say we're a C3, so we're going to have to say no a lot more often for different reasons. Um, but uh, overall, the board far and away sees the benefits of doing this far outweighing any, any kind of inconvenience that might occur from being asked to do things that we shouldn't. Jan, and I, I would, you know, at, at least when it comes to public policy in Washington, I think in the states as well, the profession, I, this is a personal opinion, mm -hmm. not the official, well, maybe, but <laughs> we are best when the, when the when CFP board is working collaboratively on policy issues with the traditional membership organization. Sure. Keith has a couple of questions. Uh, I'll take these. He asks, what additional organizational administrative expenses will there be? And will the existing members be expected to fund this second organization? Keith, I understand why you'd ask. I think that's a great question. However, uh, one, as Dan said, the change doesn't affect the certification fee. And the way we're looking at this, largely this is a realignment of programs internally. Now, our, uh, you know, from a standpoint of, of the staff and additional expense, there will be a little of additional expense, but CFP board's budget's this year $60 million. It's nominal, I think, at best. So, uh, you know, there will be uh, uh, nominal additional expense related to uh, the change. Um, will the ex so that's, you know, there, I don't think there's additional there's really not much. Dan, I'll give you this question. Um, this is another CFP professional named Dan. He asks, how does the CFP board envision the newly formed board of standards, or the C6, will interact and coordinate with other trade groups? I think we've answered that. Uh, I think we, we got that. Any other thoughts on that? No, well, one thing did pop into my head. I don't know what triggered it, but uh, I think it should be pointed out that uh, many nonprofit organizations have more than one type of entity. It's very common in, very the, common. in so my not, study group. Yeah. Uh, it's almost every CEO that I'm yep. meeting with has multiple. Yeah, we're not uh, we're not breaking new ground on that. You know, here's a here's a. Um, Question. I think we've addressed this, but I want to bring it up. Michael writes, previously, when asked why the board is not elected by the licensees, or let's use the word certificates, mm -hmm. we've been told it's because CFP board is a charity. I'm not, I, I would say a, a C3. That will no longer be true. Will the new entity enact bylaws that allow the election of directors directly by the certificates? Uh, no, we have no plans to do that. We are not forming a traditional membership organization, as I said before. Uh, so we have no no plans to change the governance structure to, to select board people in, in that way. Um, the only members of the 501c6 are the members of the board of the 501c3. 
Uh, Zan, here's a, a question from Melody. She asks, is CFP board working with FPA on title protection? And if so, what efforts have been made or will be made? Well, Melody, um, title protection, man, it's a terrific concept. It's desired by many planners. It makes perfect common sense. You shouldn't call yourself a financial planner unless you're qualified to do so. Uh, however, getting something in place that, uh, that can get pretty complex pretty fast. Um, so who knows where, where this is all going. Um, FPA is taking its time. It's gathering input from uh, many quarters of the financial planning ecosystem. I think that's a great way to go about it. It's the right way to approach the subject. I know we will be asked for our opinion and our opinion will be valued. Uh, and when it's time to do that, we will give that input. But, um, you know, right now there's, there's nothing to uh, promote um, because there's no proposal yet. And there will be, I think, sometime next year is the timeline for that that I, I think I got from uh, – FPA recently, so yeah, we're. I mean, they're going about it the right way. We're looking forward to participating, and we'll see what comes of it. Indeed. A uh, couple related questions here. Um, where will the funding for the C6 come from? Will you be expecting current CFPs to pay more? So we'll talk about that one. And then a related question: How can the fees stay the same? Things are jumping around on my screen here. How can fees stay the same? if you're going to do more. And so I'll take, take a shot, but Dan, please sure. jump in. So the, <clears throat> the fees that you pay will be allocated between the C3 and the C6. So the certification renewal fee will go to the C6, and a portion of the, C, of the fund will go to the C3. So there will be revenue there uh, for the C6. And then how will, the, how, since we're doing more, and we've talked openly about wanting to do more, and that, will, that those additional initiatives are covered by the fee increase that took effect last October or November uh, for, for, um, uh, CF, for renewal of CFP. So there was a $100 fee increase that's funding these largely. Um, Oh, here's a question. Let's take this one here. The Jacqueline asked, number 27, Jim, I'm excited about the new organization focus on awareness. There, there goes my question. Jumped around. I'm excited about the new organization's focus on awareness of the financial planning profession uh, among college-bound students. As a CFP professional, how can I help? So... Jacqueline, look, we're still working on, on what this final program will look like, but Amy Story at CFP Board is uh, working closely and is the project lead on this initiative. And if you would just drop a note to her or anybody else who's interested in working on this, her email is a story, S T O R E Y at cfpboard.org. So let's uh, appreciate the, the help. I think this is, this is an exciting new initiative. Um, let's, let me see, Dan, let's go. Let me just see. Here's, Dan, this one's one. We're going to go to mark in number 20. Uh, can the CFP board really police itself, Mark asks. Uh, if it bans CFPs for doing wrong, won't that show that CFPs may not be so honest? You were chair of the Disciplinary and Ethics Commission, um, and uh, do you have a, a thought on that? I do if you don't, but... Yeah, I got a lot of thoughts about that. Well, let me start <laughs> while you do this, and then let me let me respond to Mark, because when we survey CFP professionals every two years, and we ask them, of uh, what do we do and how important is it? Every year, either the the thing that CFPs want the most 
is for us to set and enforce our standards. Those, the vast majority, the 98, 99% who are doing the right thing don't want to be in a club, I don't use that term euphemistically, don't want to be, don't want the, the bad apples, the bad actors together. How do you, what do you think? Neither does the CFP board. I mean, <laughs> right. we, we're, we're, we're trying to help the public identify competent and ethical financial planners. And when we find out that somebody is neither one of those, we don't want them to have the mark. It's, it's that simple. Um, you know, we do have some limitations because we're not a regulator. Um, our detection capabilities, you know, we do, don't have the ability to, to uh, inspect offices no intent or want to do that uh, and the like. So we're, we're relying on other people to tell us about uh, bad behavior. But uh, when we learn about it, there is a defined process. It's pretty darn good. Uh, the proceedings are confidential. That process is not. It's our procedural rules. Uh, and uh, we follow them. And we have outside parties um, looking at it to make sure that the, those processes are followed appropriately. So we, uh, we're doing all we know to do. Uh, and trying to increase our capabilities in that area as much as possible, uh, but we don't. We don't want. Um, we only want competent and ethical people using those marks. Indeed, and we spend a, a big. I mean, it is a significant expense. Stan, you know, you this vote to approve the budget. Yep. To, it's a big chunk of our of our budget to to enforce those standards because look the way I <clears throat> as I see some of you have heard me say this before there are 230 designations and certifications on the FINRA website yeah. there are five five I believe that have any evidence of enforce they all have some high-minded code of conduct but most of them, there's no evidence of enforcement of those and I believe the reason that the the consumer finance press, policymakers, and others look so favorably at CFP certification is because they know that we have high standards. I would even say it's the standard for, for financial planning, and they know there are consequences if people don't live up to those high standards. Yep. All right. Um, here's a question from Jason. Uh, he asks, how can we help with promoting the marks? I'd like to see more efforts at HBCUs. And, you know, <clears throat> with, the new, uh, with the new strategic plan, one of the initiatives we have is a, a degree program growth initiative. We have hired uh, uh, Phil Dawson on the CFP board staff to do outreach to bring on new colleges and universities because it's kind of a chicken or an egg thing, Dan. If we're going to go out and promote financial planning as an attractive career choice, we have 130 colleges and universities that have degree programs. Yep. We're going to need more degree programs. And uh, the HBCUs are a part of that initiative. So, Jason, if you uh, have an interest in this, and we're happy to know about that. You can contact Phil Dawson, send him an email at p dawson d a w s o n at cfpboard dot org. Um, Diana Diana asks, uh, how will this change CFP board's advocacy efforts within the profession? Advocacy is one of the board is advocacy. Is advocacy one of the board's strategic initiatives? So, we have engagement uh, at the at the advocacy level, but how you know we've talked a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, as far as being a strategic initiative, there's no grand advocacy agenda that we're gearing up to put through. Uh, but being uh, having a six and a three, the six does allow us to take advocacy positions that we shouldn't. As a C3, as a C3, you've all got to come out exclusively, almost exclusively, from the benefit of the uh, public, that perspective, and we'll be able to chime in on things uh, that will be beneficial to uh, the profession. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done there because that means, again, we're going to be asked to sign on to things, and uh, we're going to have to create some, you know, we're we'll begun the process of starting to create some of the filters for determining the framework by which we prioritize right, right. and assess yep. uh, uh, policy efforts. Yep. J. 
Joseph asks, when will new changes in the certification standards be implemented? Don't know. So, you know, we've started the competency <coughs> commission to look at these things. We don't know what the recommendations are going to be. It's the first comprehensive um, review that the organization has done, as far as we know. Um, so it's going to, you know, it's a big project. It's going to, it's going to take a while. So we got to have to get the commission um, geared up, uh, out there getting information, talking to all sorts of stakeholders on uh, the various uh, forms of. Uh, competency standards that we have, the education, experience, uh, exam, et cetera, and uh, there's a process there, so I, I don't anticipate. It's, it's going to be, you know, the ethical standards review uh, at least two years, and so, uh, and that was, you know, they wrapped up their work, but they we didn't approve them until 2018, and they did, weren't fully implemented until 2020. So, well, we're looking to 2023. Uh, the Competency Commission will take stock of the current, what we're currently doing, and how that compares with other high stakes examinations and certifications. And then it will be 2024 before they have recommendations. And the process will be just like the ethics. The Commission will make its recommendation first to the board of directors the board if they you know will decide to release them for public comment just yep. as we've done Absolutely. the public will comment then you know the commission will go back and assess whether or not you know what changes they want they'll either recommend that the board adopt them or that they go out for comment again so it's a bit of a a process you know when you think about all that's involved in setting the standards for financial planning. It's really quite an involved process. We'll have on this commission, I think we'll have 12 to 14 individuals from a broad cross-section, including public member representation, members of established professions, other certification bodies. So it's uh, as obviously as well as uh, CFP professionals. Um, next question. Um, let me, let's go to number 39, John, uh, here. Uh, any discussion on having two boards made partially of existing members and new members that allows for more participation and the development opportunity for new board members? So I think the question is really, you know, and this was something the governance committee talked about a good bit, uh, Dan, was uh, should the boards be the same? Could they be different? What's the thinking there? Yeah, they can be different uh, in the future. Uh, they're not going to be uh, from the start. Um, we have basically two board meetings now. We have a C3 board meeting and a C6 board meeting. And just to get it off and running and get this thing going, we wanted to keep it as simple and as straightforward as possible. But there is there is a, a room to have a, a slightly different uh, board for the C6 in, in the future. We'll we'll see when or if that ever happens. That'll be for a future board to decide. Indeed, and <clears throat> I think uh, that's something that future boards will will have to determine as we as we go forward. I'll take this next question. You know, it's almost impossible to. Uh, uh, you know, politics falls, it seems like, uh, in everything. Will writes to us, I'm disheartened to learn that CFP board is joining the woke culture of our society. Can someone explain why we aren't promoting CFP professionals exclusively, regardless of their color, gender, sexual orientation, why can't we simply be satisfied that a person, regardless of race, gender, or whatever, passes the exam and benefits the public? Why push this? Do you want to take a shot at that? Do you want me to take that? Go ahead. All right. So first of all, I'm not sure what uh, Will means by woke. I mean, I know what the, the political context or what he thinks that we're pushing. Um, Look, we're promoting CFP board and CFP certification to everyone interested in a rewarding career. 
and to everyone who could benefit from the services of a competent and ethical financial planner. Dan, I, if I've heard you say it once, I know you've said at least a dozen times, and I couldn't agree more. We believe the world is a better place when there are more CFP professionals. We also believe, Will, that the financial planning profession will be stronger when the CFP professional community looks more closely like the demographics of the public that we serve. Now, at CFP Board, our diversity initiatives are designed to move us to that, more closely to that goal. We've got a long ways to go. We're nowhere close. And we've made a commitment to be transparent about the progress that we're making. Our uh, underrepresented groups, Black, Hispanic, Latino, and others, grew three times faster, two and a half to three times faster last year than the overall CFP community. I'm glad we're making the progress. The standards are no different. The standards are what the standards are. Sometimes people come to me and say, why are you lowering the standards to uh, uh, meet this goal? It's absolutely not true, uh, but we are committed to, to making a difference. So. Yep. Well, I, I, we hadn't mentioned that in this whole discussion, but that's an important backdrop to this whole evolution with the creation of the C6. We want more certified financial planners in the world, but we can't get there and grow numbers by lowering standards to do it. That's right. not the way. That's not the way to advance a profession. We need to uh, be uh, more direct, be able to be more direct about uh, our messaging. And the benefits. And the benefits. That's, that's, that's where we need to apply the gas a little bit. Dan, I'll give you uh, this question. Christina asks, how are you addressing the digital asset themes in regarding practice management, asset allocation, et cetera? Yeah, um, so from the perspective of uh, what goes on the exam, for instance, and, and, and that type of thing, there's a, a defined process for that to happen. Uh, and it's not a quick one. It comes from what planners are doing with their clients. There's a, a, a job study that's done every few years to assess that, and as things bubble up, they become part of the exam process. But the world moves a little bit faster than that process does, and um, digital asset themes and crypto and stuff like that is a great example of it. Um, so we're not powerless to, to uh, address those issues. We do it through, uh, in this case, through guidance from uh, the perspective of the, the Code of Ethics uh, and Standards of Conduct. Uh, so we've got a very extensive uh, guidance library, and one of the newest additions to that is what a CFP professional's responsibilities are under the code uh, with respect to uh, handling and advising clients about digital assets. So you can get that at cfp.net slash compliance. Uh, there's some publicity about it in the, in the fall when it came out, so you might be able to, to spot it uh, in that way as well. But it, it brings into play, uh, you know, duty of competence, the fiduciary duty, uh, the duty to provide information to a client, comply with the law, duties when selecting, recommending, and using technology, all of those things interplay when it comes to digital assets and crypto. So I encourage you to, to take a look at that guidance and any of the other guidance in that library. It's, it's pretty extensive. It's pretty impressive. I mean, I'm an SEC registered advisor, and we have questions about how to comply, and it's sometimes very difficult. Black hole. Yeah, it's almost it's very tough to get stuff out of the SEC. But. So the, you can get that guidance, cfp.net slash compliance. Dan, I think we have time for a couple more questions before yeah. we come up to the top of the hour. Um, <clears throat> Joseph asked, in relation to the competency commission, will the requirements to attain, and I would add maintain, CFP certification change, for example, the need for a bachelor's degree? That's one that I get a lot. Yeah. Right. Uh, it comes up particularly in the, the diversity conversation. A lot of people think that that's a, a barrier, know that it's a barrier um, for a lot of underrepresented communities. 
I have no idea how that's going to come out, but yeah, they're going to look at that. Um, Actually, I will ask that everything is on the table. Everything is on the table. That's right. Everything is on yep. the table. Um, Dan, uh, this question, Kate asks, is there a study showing the actual improvement the public receives from using a CFP professional? I don't know if I've seen one specific to CFP professionals. So there's the the Alpha, there's Vanguard Vanguard Alpha, Alpha, then there's the Gamma Gamma. that uh, David Blanchett uh, worked on. Most of those are from an investment perspective. So one of the exciting things that we have launched is a uh, study on just what you're talking about, Um, not just being served by a CFP professional and non-CFP professionals, but specifically on different elements of financial planning as opposed to just the investment management. It's a longitudinal study. Uh, that's just getting off the ground. You can yeah, no, it's one, one of the strategic that. initiatives. Uh, a client impact research, a long-term longitudinal study where we seek to assess and understand the impact that financial planning has on the well-being of its clients, and we're looking across a a broad socioeconomic background. I'm very excited. We've hired – this, again, was one of the strategic initiatives that the fee increase will fund. We've hired Dr. Mike Kosakota, Ph.D., CFP, who is leading our research efforts. We'll be working with leading uh, researchers across the country on this initiative. I think it's, you know, it's exciting. We're not going to have to wait a decade because they'll be working on research throughout. But this is something, you know, you've talked about the Harvard Twin study. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, well, and my father-in-law actually has participated in a Harvard study for over 60 years where he logs his diet and takes blood tests every six months. And, his cohort that's been doing that for a long time. So, yeah, it's, there's incredible, incredible learnings you can get from from tracking um, folks over long periods of time. Great. All right. I think we're almost out of time. Dan, what closing thoughts do you have? I just want to thank everybody for uh, ongoing support of um, CFP board and CFP certification. We don't have a profession without professionals doing a wonderful job for their clients day in and day out. Uh, each of you plays an important role in our work. As Kevin noted, we rely on our CFP professionals and other stakeholders to achieve our mission to benefit the public. It's our CFP professionals who provide the public with the access to competent and ethical financial planning. We'd not be able to achieve our mission without you. And we look forward to continuing our work together to advance the profession. Dan, I want to thank you and, and the entire board of directors um, you, you know, from a standpoint of a CEO, you make – when you set clear expectations and clear priorities, then we at the staff level can execute on those. It's hard to execute, you've heard me say, on ambiguity. Uh, in closing, thank you all for joining us for today's webinar. A recording of this presentation will be posted to CFP Board's website within the next few business days, and CFP Board will follow up individually with those of you who asked questions we did not get to during this broadcast. Kevin Keller, Dan Moisan from Fort Lauderdale, Florida, saying so long. Thank you.